Thanks everybody for joining us today. My name is Sydney Peasley and I am a project manager with the Greater Des Moines Partnership. I work in talent development and specifically with our Seize the City program, which is an intern program for students that are working in the Des Moines region over the summer at a variety of organizations. In a typical year, we host a lot of programming in person. Um, we do programming sessions focused on professional development skills. We provide some social opportunities for students to get connected with each other and also to meet some executives in the region. And this year, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing guidelines from the state and federal level, um, we decided to move the program to a virtual platform, which is why we're hosting this um, session today with Danny via Zoom. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'll turn it over to Danny to introduce himself and to kick us off, and then we'll do some questions. Um, I do ask that anybody that's part of the um, webinar, please keep your microphones muted so we don't have a lot of background noise happening. And if you've got any questions for Danny at any point in time, feel free to drop those in the chat, and we'll make sure we get those to him before we wrap things up. So Danny, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sydney. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Super excited to be talking with all of you digitally right now. Uh, been a part of uh, the Seize the City program with the partnership for many years, and this is probably one of the more unique experiences that I've had, um, just as all of you have, I'm sure. Um, just a little bit of a background on me. I am lead advisor at Iron Horse Wealth Management. Um, so I'm a financial advisor by trade, by day, uh, networking, aficionado, bow tie guy, um, by afternoon nights. I'm a father of two wonderful daughters married to my wife, Casey, uh, and really have built my success and have been able to do the things I've been able to do because of the people that surround me, the network that I have supporting me. And, and that's really what I want to talk about with everyone on the call today. I even got one of my networking groups. I see a bunch of them on this call supporting me today. So shout out uh, to West Des Moines Alliance for joining this as well. Uh, but really wanted to touch base, give some thoughts, give some tips um, to those college interns, to anybody that's on this call um, uh, about what it's like to network, what it's like to build relationships and connect with people in a time when, you know, social distancing is highly encouraged. We've got people wearing masks. We've got uh, individuals who are still isolated on home lockdown. And just like we all were March, April, you know, very encouraged with businesses closing down, working from home, just not a lot of physical interaction, physical contact. And so I, I want to share over the next hour or so some things that I've learned, some practices that I've adopted, uh, some ways that I've been able to continue being connected with people throughout all of this, take questions, take feedback, learn from you all as well. Uh, a couple of the things that I told Sydney I wanted to just touch on before we go to the Q&A part is I've found even through all of this craziness, all through individuals, you know, not being able to leave their homes or through the countless number of Zoom meetings um, or Skype or FaceTime or whatever it has been that you've been uh, connecting with people on, um, there's still some truths that, that have remained for me this entire time. Um, the first thing that I want to share with everybody is I always encourage people who have told me that they're not good at networking or they, they want to get more out of networking. How, how do I get more out of my network or how do I get more comfortable? The number one tip that I have for people is just ask better questions. And that continues through this, whether we're, we're meeting face to face or whether we're meeting through a computer screen or even through a phone call. By asking better questions, you're going to have better conversations. You're going to learn more about the individual you're meeting with, you're speaking with. And honestly, you're going to build a better connection and a better relationship long term. Most of the time when we're on an event or we're out in public, you meet someone for the first time, the exchange is pretty much the same. Hi, I'm Danny. It's beautiful outside. What do you do for a living? We've all been programmed. That's the socially normal thing to do. It's simple, it's easy, but it's also really boring. And it's really hard to convey, convey ideas as well as make a connection if we always go straight to the what do you do question. A simple alternative, something that I like to do is what do you do for fun? Uh, what do you do on the weekends? What are you passionate about? Or my all-time favorite question of all time uh, still to this day is what's your story? You can still have that, hi, I'm Danny, it's nice outside, but instead of just going with that safe, easy question, 
ask a better question. What's your story? Something that is more open-ended. You're going to learn a lot more about the person and they're going to get an opportunity to share what they want to know or that they want you to know about them versus just having to talk about work or having to talk about what they do nine to five. I love what I do as a financial advisor. A lot of people don't want to hear me talk about it. Uh, It either freaks them out Um, gives them anxiety or they've just met so many financial advisors, they don't care that I'm a financial advisor. But when I get to talk about the fact that I've got my two kids, that I've got a wonderful wife, uh, the connections that I have in the community, the things I'm doing through the various boards and the organizations I serve, it's a lot more fun and it's a better conversation to have with people. Uh, One of the other tips I wanted to start with, and then like I said, and like Sydney said, we're gonna go right into Q&A kind of stuff just to get this more interactive is I will close every meeting I have, even through Zoom, through phone calls, through FaceTime, through whatever we're doing right now in person with one question, how can I help you? I would encourage everyone on this call to adopt that philosophy um, from this point forward. How can I help you is a simple question. And if you mean it, if you follow through, if you're given something, it's amazing what doors open up for you and what opportunities open up for you. Uh, My favorite story of all time, Uh, I was giving a presentation like this in person to a group of executive directors. Uh, And uh, towards the end of it, one of them said, hey, I have an introduction I want to do for you. Is that okay? I said, of course. She introduced me to her friend, the executive director of an organization called Booster Pack. Um, Booster Pack works in conjunction with the West Des Moines schools free and reduced meal program. So free and reduced meals, if you're unaware, provides food uh, during the day to kids, to families who can't afford it or who are underprivileged and, and need this assistance. So these kids get breakfast and get lunch, but they don't get food on nights and weekends. Uh, Melanie was telling me that she created Booster Pack to help subsidize free and reduced meals so that these same kids will get food on nights and weekends. I'm like, that's awesome. Why, why did you decide to do this? She explained that there was a lot of behavioral studies. There was a lot of things uh, that, that people had found. These kids would come to school Monday and Tuesday, and they'd have a lot of behavioral issues, a lot of outbursts, because they would come to school hungry. It wasn't that they didn't want to be there. It wasn't that they didn't want to learn. They were just, they were hungry, and they, they needed the nourishment. Um, and so by creating booster packs, she was getting food to these kids. So at the end of the conversation comes and I said, you know, how can I help you, Melanie? And she got the biggest smile on her face. And she goes, Danny, I I knew you were going to ask that question. Someone told me you would ask that and I I have something for you. I said, okay, shoot. Uh, She said, you know, my meal, my my program's working great for the kindergarten, the first, the second and the third graders. But come fourth and fifth grade, I, I see a decline in participation. I see a decline in usage of the program. I just don't see these kids. Uh, I asked the question, well, why does that happen? And she goes, well, Danny, if you remember elementary school, fourth and fifth grade is when kids really start to notice the differences in each other. And so these kids have a choice when they, when they hit that age. They can stop seeing me and be considered normal and not get made fun of, or they can come and get the food they need and get made fun of. Inevitably, they're going to choose to be normal and go hungry. Well, now I'm, I'm married to a kindergarten teacher. My heart breaks a little bit. And I said, okay, you got me. Anything I can do, what can I do to help you? Uh, And she goes, all I really need is some drawstring backpacks, the kind of backpacks that you see, you know, some clothing stores, as well as if you register and run a 5k, you might get some of your goodie bag in one of those drawstring backpacks. Um, My thought is I can put the food in those, the kids can come pick up their drawstring backpacks, they're reusable. No one's going to know there's food in it, could be shoes, could be clothes for an after school activity. That way the kids can at least come and and see me. And I said, well, I've I've got about five in the bottom of my closet from previous things that that I've attended. How many do you need? And she goes, well, I I would like about 50. You know, I got a little anxious and I said, well, you've got the five that I have. Let me see what I can do. That afternoon, I went back to my office. I got on Facebook. Um, I put out one message. Hey, everyone, looking for some drawstring backpacks for a local nonprofit. Message me if you can help. Uh, throughout that day, I got onesie twosie messages just like I had where, you know, I've got four or five that, that I can give you. Let me know when you want to get together to pick them up. And I'm like, okay, we're going to get there. It's going to take a while, but we'll get these 50 backpacks. A couple hours go by and my phone rings with a number that I don't recognize. Picked it up. Uh, it turned out it was one of my brother's best friends. And he introduced himself, said he saw the message on Facebook, wanted to know what I was looking for. So just as I'm telling all of you today, I told him that story. 
uh, he's, I could hear him kind of chuckling. He goes, well, I just got done with a race for a nonprofit that I helped organize last weekend. Uh, I happen to be driving around. I got about 200 drawstring backpacks in the back of my truck right now. Do you think those will work? Uh, Chris was his name. I said, Chris, that's awesome. Yes, where can I meet you? He just laughed and he goes, Danny, I'm already out and about. Give me Melanie's address and I'll drop them off. I didn't even have to meet the guy. I, I had to spend about seven minutes of my time on the phone with him. And he was willing to help and drop these drawstring backpacks off to Melanie. I still keep in touch with her. Kids are still eating today because of that one message on Facebook. Uh, so when I say opportunities will present themselves, doors will open, you don't know what, what might happen by asking the question, how can I help you? Uh, it still makes my heart happy to know that kids are eating because of one message that I put out there because of one simple ask that an executive director had for me. So I would encourage everyone, if you don't hear anything else from this conversation today or from this presentation, um, start asking people how you can help them and see what presents it, itself to you. Uh, you're going to have a lot of fun. There's going to be a lot of ways for you to get connected, both professionally and personally. Uh, and with that, Sydney, I will turn it over to you to see what questions we might have. Great. I have one already related to your point of always asking how you can help. And that is, um, as a student, if you're asking for help, what kind of help do you recommend that students ask for from those that they are networking with? Awesome question. So what kind of help should they be asking for? Um, one of the other tips that I love to give, and you just softballed me a great question. I uh, don't know if that was pre-planned or not, but um, you have to be willing to tell people what you want in order to get it. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we're, we're brought up or we're told, especially if you're from Iowa, if you're, you're Midwest nice um, or Iowa nice, um, you're told, hey, you can't, you can't tell people what you want or don't appear needy or don't appear like you need something or salesy or whatever. I don't know where that idea came from, but we need to get over it and we need to tell people how they can help us because I found it time and time and time again that people are willing to help. They just don't know how. The only way for them to know how is for you to tell them. Um, and so for the students on this call and for the professionals, uh, if you guys are looking for something specific from a relationship or from somebody that you're connecting with, don't be afraid to tell them how they can help you. Don't be afraid to make that ask because you never know what they're going to be willing to do for you. I've had both uh, friends and family members help me out with things, but I've also had complete and total strangers bend over backwards to do an introduction or get me in front of someone, um, both professionally or personally, um, just because I was willing to ask the question. If you think you're coming off as salesy, if you think you're coming off as needy, the only advice that I have for you is you just got to get over it because the only way to move ideas forward, the only way to get things done is to tell people how that they can help you and, and see if they're willing to help. Um, so for those interns um, on this call, for those individuals looking to, to get into a role, um, go out for coffee or do Zoom calls or whatever you're comfortable with, um, with the coworkers, with individuals um, in the places that you're working and just shoot some ideas off of them. Ask them the questions about, you know, why do you work here? What do you love about this culture? What do you hate about what you have to do? Um, what would you recommend someone like me who wants to get into this do? Uh, and if you have an opportunity, if you see something there um, where you might wanna have a job there in the future, or you might wanna work for that person, let them know that you're interested in that. Um, I'm a big fan that um, genuine flattery can get you everywhere. You just have to be genuine with it. Um, so don't be afraid to make those asks. All right, that's great. Um, these are a couple of questions that we got prior to. So if you want to kind of work through these, um, how have you adjusted to networking during the time of COVID-19 and being online? And then now as we're sort of starting to transition out of and back into a new normal, what are you doing to um, those, uh, those are both, both awesome questions. So how have you adjusted to networking during COVID slash online? Um, thanks to the Greater Des Moines Partnership and to a lot of the chambers, a lot of the associations, a lot of just the networking organizations, because they were able to pivot very effectively and very quickly to online. 
Um, my little networking group that's on the call today, it, we took a week off when this was all really blowing up and we didn't know what was going on. But shortly after that, we coordinated so that we would have our networking meeting by Zoom um, on the same schedule that we were before so that we could keep seeing each other, so we could keep checking in on each other. Um, a lot of it had to do in the beginning, especially for me, I was just checking in on mental health of people, didn't even care what business was being done, just wanted to make sure that they were okay, um, because this is was a completely new situation. We didn't know what was coming. We didn't know what was happening next. And so I was making it a priority to make sure people were okay more than anything else. Uh, business continued to happen. Business continued to move forward through all of this. Um, we got really good between our group, but other, also just meeting with people online through phone calls. Uh, it was incredible to me how quickly people adapted to the online presence and being willing to meet online. Uh, so really, adjusting my ask changed from hey do you want to grab a cup of coffee to hey do you want to do a zoom coffee uh, that was really the the biggest change in my wording um and in how i handled those types of interactions uh people quickly adjusted like i said and all of a sudden i was having coffees i was having drinks uh with individuals while they were in their homes it actually turned out to be a lot of fun because i got to see and as we've seen in news articles and in tv shows uh, newscast. You got to see kind of a private side of people that you might not have gotten to see before where we were sneaking into their living rooms and you got to see um, how people lived. My wife and I for some Zoom happy hours that we did created this uh, uh, palm tree backdrop behind us that my daughter's colored. So when you logged in and saw us at home, you got this super sweet palm tree going on behind us and beach scene because we just wanted to pretend that we were not in the middle of a pandemic anytime we were doing a happy hour with people. Um, I have found that through those Zoom calls, through those interactions, phone calls, all the other things, um, it seems that business gets done a lot faster. There's a lot less of the social aspect of it. There's a lot less of the social time and it is much more business related. Um, a bunch of my coworkers and I have all commented on how quickly these calls happen compared to what we were used to with individual meetings um, because there's just there is less time or it seems like less interest in the small talk ahead of time so take that for what it's worth if you like the small talk end i'm sure you can still extend it out but if you don't um, this may be something you do for the rest of your life and continue with the zoom end of things um, my final story on the uh, networking online my wife is a teacher as i mentioned and her district got onto Zoom with about four weeks left or so in the school year. Um, it was so much fun to see my daughters doing these calls and seeing their classmates um, and just being able to see their teacher and the joy that it brought them. So uh, while we all are probably getting tired of seeing each other digitally and doing Zoom meetings and doing education through things like this, um, there is a percentage of the population that really truly loved it. Um, and I think moving forward, we're gonna see a lot more people willing to do these types of meetings compared to what it was even a short six months ago. Um, for the next piece on transitioning out of social distancing and adjusting to this new normal, uh, there's a couple things I'm doing right now just as we are uh, really adjusting and, and people are willing to meet face to face again. I typically will preface any meeting with with more than one option and do you want to grab a cup of coffee if you're not comfortable with that uh, do you want to do a zoom call do you want to do a phone call and i always leave it in the individual that i'm going to be meeting with um, in their court i am comfortable meeting face to face that's just how i how i see the world right now um, as we've learned more about how this virus works, um, but I want to make sure the people I'm meeting with are comfortable as well. I also preface and let them know that I am meeting with others so that if they're not comfortable with the fact that I'm meeting with people that they can do a Zoom meeting if they, if they would prefer to do that. Um, if they're coming into our office, we have the cleaning procedures in place. We're disinfecting everything with bleach. Um, Clorox spray and everything else in between each individual meeting. Um, and then when I do see people out at Friedrichs or out at the various coffee shops that are starting to reopen, I take a lot of social cues from them or I just ask, hey, are you comfortable shaking hands? Are you comfortable fist bumping? You want to elbow bump? You would not want to touch at all. Um, and, and really just leave it up to that individual. I think you're going to find more and more um, people are going to adjust to the comfort of the individuals they're meeting with. Um, I also permanently travel with a mask on me so that if the individuals I'm meeting with um, would prefer a mask, I have it and can put it on. 
Um, if they don't, I'm cool with that. Is I'm I'm pretty neutral on this whole thing and meeting with people. So um, I would just say, don't be afraid to ask those questions too. Uh, if you are meeting with someone and you know you're usually a hugger and you used to hug them, ask them if they still want to hug. And if you're not comfortable with hugging anymore, just say you don't want to hug anymore. Um, have the communication, have it open. That's the only way that we're really going to figure out how we should interact with people moving forward. That's great, Danny. Um, as you're starting to meet with people more in person, are you finding that the individuals you're meeting with are willing and interested in doing that? Or are a lot of people still really hesitant? The last two weeks, it's been kind of crazy. I've seen, I would say about 60% of the people that I've reached out to are willing to meet in person where another, you know, 40% or so are still wanting to do Zoom calls, wanting to do phone calls, don't feel comfortable doing in person right now. Um, I set three meetings this morning and all three of them are in person. Um, so it, it's been, um, it's been kind of crazy how quickly, in my opinion, people really have adjusted to wanting to go back to meeting in person. Um, and I really don't want to make any of this political. And so I'm trying to kind of skate around the edges of the COVID thing and, and stay away from political beliefs there. So again, I'm just leaving it up to the individuals that I'm meeting with because I'm willing to meet in person, if that makes sense. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for that. We've got a question here in the chat. Um, how would you recommend introductions be made when everyone can't meet in person? You email both people you want to connect, the same email. Um, do you send one person information about the other person to test the waters, send a Zoom meeting invitation? How are you handling that? So one of, this is something that I've done my entire career and it's, it's the, the email introduction um, because I find it, it provides a lot of um, opportunity for individuals to connect and it almost always has a 100% success rate as far as people actually connecting and, and getting together to chat. And so um, what I have been doing, and I actually just got one from another mutual connection just before this call that I thought was brilliant. Um, he sent an email to me with the individual that he wanted me to connect with. And in the email, he, he did the normal, Danny, this is, uh, this is Bob. Bob, this is Danny. Here's a little bit about Bob for you, Danny. Danny, here's a little bit about Bob. Um, so forth and so on so that we get kind of the history and why he's connecting us and then he put in the last couple lines he goes i will leave it to you two to connect from here um you guys figure out what is best for both of you so i responded back i thanked i thanked my friend for the introduction i said hey bob uh, i'm good meeting in person or i'm good doing a zoom call whatever you would prefer he emailed right back and said actually I, i'm still doing zoom calls would you be available next week Yep, so we've got it on the calendar, it's set. We're both comfortable, everybody's happy, the connection is moving forward. Um, and so I would encourage people to just kind of take that same approach. Um, I do a lot of third party introductions where um, I typically I may reach out if, uh, if I think it's required, I may reach out for permission to do an introduction, but most of the time, the people that I know that I'm connecting, I've already built a good enough relationship with. I know if I'm doing an introduction for value, they're going to accept the, um, they're going to accept the relationship. And so I'll just send a, an email out that says, Hey Mike, this is, this is Jill, Jill, this is Mike. Um, you guys need to get together. Here's the reasons why go ahead and connect from here and then I'm out. I, I don't force it anymore. I don't set the appointment for them. I let them take it um, and move it forward so that those individuals can connect and really figure out the best way for them to connect, whether it's in person, whether it's uh, online, uh, whether they see the value or not. It, it just it allows them the opportunity to figure out what makes the most sense moving forward. All right, great. Um, moving on to some of the next questions we've got here. Have you noticed any significant differences or practices in doing Zoom or phone calls versus in-person meetings? You mentioned earlier that there's a little less small talk. Anything else that you're noticing? And then are any of those changes you hope to see um, continue in a post-COVID-19 world? <laughs> those are awesome. Um, the biggest one is still that, uh, that lack of small talk. It, it seems like a meeting that normally would have taken an hour uh, for in-person is now taking 30 to 40 minutes, um, which is a good thing, is a bad thing, depending on your perspective and depending on what, what you 
like to get out of relationships and how you like to communicate with people. Um, I still think that there's some, some good stuff that, that can come out of those meetings, but people just really are not as engaged to, to have those, those kind of small talk interactions with each other, it seems like, through a computer screen. Um, it still happens, but, but just not at the same level. Um, the other thing that I've noticed with, uh, with doing Zoom or phone calls and, and the work from home environment um, is just the vulnerability I think people are willing to put themselves in that they may not have been able to do before this. Um, I've met people's kids, I've met people's spouses, I've met people's pets, um, I've seen hobbies. Just because I'm in people's houses now, it's, it's not purely a business thing anymore. So while the small talk may die out, um, a little bit, there is still incredible things that I've learned and incredible experiences that I've had with people. Um, I worked from home for a good four weeks prior to starting to come into the office kind of part-time through all of this. And it seemed like no matter what I did, one of my daughters was Zoom bomb me every single time. No matter what treat I gave them or instructions I gave them, they would come in and say hi and meet whoever I was talking to on the phone. Um, through all that, I never had a client. I never had a referral partner. I never had a friend go, Danny, what, why can't you be more professional? They were always super excited to meet my kids and super excited to tell them hi. Um, it's just, it's a cool experience. And so with uh, differences, practices, changes, that I hope to continue seeing in a post COVID-19 world. Um, I actually, I don't mind the Zoom interaction and I could actually see a lot of businesses changing some of their practices to where meetings that used to be done in person, they're found are no longer required um, to be done in person anymore and, and can be handled through Zoom. So there's expenses that could be saved there. In my profession with being a financial advisor, I've had clients that I, I'll do reviews for at eight, nine o'clock, or not, sorry, four or five o'clock in the afternoon. They used to have to come into my office to do the reviews. They'd have to find a babysitter. Um, you know, we'd, we'd make the best of the hour and then they'd go home. I've had a ton of those reviews where they've just done it with done those reviews with me from their kitchen table while the kids play in the background. Um, they don't have to drive in. We still get to cover the important things that we would have covered anyway. Uh, they get to sign off at five o'clock and they're already at home with their kids making supper. There's, there's no more travel time. There's no finding the babysitter. Wouldn't surprise me if a lot of that stuff changed and I don't, I don't have any problems problems with it. I think it's a, a great opportunity for us to use this technology, but continue to build those relationships moving forward. Hey, Danny, um, <clears throat> Mike Jefferson here again. Thanks for, for being a part of this today. I'm uh, just kind of monitoring uh, the chat in addition to, to Sydney. Uh, I have a question here relating to your story about the uh, drawstring backpacks and how you can help. Uh, what would this look like for a college student or an intern? And is it something that can be done at this point of our career? or is it something that we should wait on? I would say, oh, and hi, Mike. Um, I would say <laughs> don't, um, don't ever cut yourself short um, with being an intern or with judging your lack of experience or your perceived lack of experience. I would encourage everybody on this call, seasoned professionals down to interns, down to just individuals who might be in between jobs looking for work right now because of what's going on, still ask the question. Um, because you don't know what might be offered and you don't know what uh, you might receive in return. Uh, I remember early on in my career when I adopted this philosophy, um, I asked one of my mentors at the time if there was anything he could help me with. And he, he looked at me and he goes, right now, I don't think so, but um, let me think on it. And about 24 hours later, he emailed me that, remember this is 2010, 2011. Uh, he emailed me and said, hey, you seem to be really good at the social media thing. I don't know anything about Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. Could you help me with that? And it was the start of a really good reciprocal relationship because I was able to go on and help him build out his LinkedIn presence, uh, get on Facebook, start a business page. And now a couple of his speaking things have really taken off because of the time we spent together. Uh, it was a skill set that I wasn't even aware that I truly had until he pointed out that I was getting good results on social media, getting good follow-up connections with people. Um, so something I took for granted is just kind of this secondary thing really benefited him, which is why I, I totally recommend, and again, preface, don't sell yourself short. Start asking how can you help each other or help one another uh, and see what opportunities come up because you never know what's going to happen. Great info on that, Danny. Um, some next questions we've got for you. 
Um, how do you track your success or return on investment with networking? And has this tracking process been different in the midst of COVID? Um, so the success or the return on investment, this is one of those questions I get almost every single time I do this presentation because there's a lot of people who are very concerned and I understand about wasting time. I get it. You don't want to be somewhere um, and not get results or not get a return for the time that you're putting in there. Uh, if you're really going to take building relationships, building a, a true um, network that's going to serve you as well as be able to uh, to allow you to serve it, it's going to take time. Uh, networking is never a sprint. Networking's a marathon. Um, and so my return on investment has always just been that if I got to meet someone that I could created a connection with that I might be able to help in the future, that's all the return I'm looking for. Um, not sure if that's going to make me a rich person or not, but that's not really my goal. My goal is much more focused on individuals um, and helping people be successful uh, and helping connect individuals so that they can move their dreams and their ideas forward. It has paid dividends to me time and time again, both in my business and professional life. Um, but the one thing that I encourage everybody is if you're going to jump into this, um, whether you're doing online digital networking events, whether when the world starts to open up, you do start going to associations or to chambers or to whatever um, group you want to attend. My real return on investment is to meet one interesting person at each specific networking event I attend. Um, if you can have that one interesting conversation and have it turned into something that you might be able to, to move forward um, professionally or personally for you, you've been successful at networking. Uh, that being said, uh, I don't go and try to set 15 appointments at every single event. I don't try to get 15 business cards because that's just a waste of time. I truly do try to go in and have one meaningful conversation with one person every time I, I attend a, a physical networking or an online networking event. Um, that has not changed during COVID. That's still my goal. If I attend something that's being put on digitally, my, my hope is to meet one person that I can connect with. Um, now, maybe in person, but also online after the event is over, have a good meaningful conversation with, learn more about them, learn how I can help them, uh, and maybe move something forward that I'm working on as well. We've got a follow-up question to that. And as you've been doing some of these virtual networking events, how have you gotten connected to those events or found out about them? And for students, what are your recommendations for getting plugged into those opportunities? Uh, the first one, and this is not a shameless plug for the partnership, but you guys just do a really great job of it. Um, follow the Greater Des Moines Partnership on Facebook, on LinkedIn, um, on Twitter, because you guys do a great job of promoting when you have events coming up. You also, I think, have an online calendar that shows all of these events, not only for the partnership, but for the various chambers that are members. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sydney or nope, Mike. No, we do. That's right. Okay, perfect. Um, so that's the easiest place to find stuff like this right now because almost every business uh, chamber in the region is doing some sort of online networking um, consistently, whether it's Urbandale, West Des Moines, downtown, Fuse, all of them have something on the calendar where members can come, they can connect. And I would encourage you as interns to start attending those things. Um, the first couple don't have an agenda, don't have any set idea other than to attend and hear what people are saying and see if you can connect with someone who sounds interesting. Um, as you go through these, if you find places that are more successful or have more of the attendees that you're looking for, then start attending those organizations events more often versus all of the events. If you have a nonprofit you're interested in, if you have an association that you're interested in, um, see if they're doing anything, go to their website, um, Google them, see what events are coming up. Um, because there's a ton of digital stuff happening. And right now, I would say most of it's being broadcast through some form of social media more than anything else. Danny, I have another question for you. Um, and kind of a, also a, a plug for your, your book that, that ties that bind because there's a, a really good story in there um, that I can tie into this question. So now for people that are moving more to the Zoom interview and, you know, thinking of college students. I know in your book, you had stories of things not to do at networking events, you know, not having food and drink in your hand at the same time and those sorts of, <laughs> and those sorts of things. Um, do you have, or have you come up with a list of, of don'ts maybe that would translate to the Zoom world? To the maybe Zoom not? world, yeah. Um, no, that, that's, that's an awesome question. Um, 
the first thing that I would recommend is always test what you think you're doing <laughs> because <laughs> there's a lot of things, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Skype, whether um, it's Microsoft Teams, that if you go into a call and you think, okay, I'm going to share my screen, you get on the call and it turns out you have to download a patch or you have to download a feature in order to share your screen. And the only way to do that is to close the program. Well, now you're on the meeting, you're ready to share your screen and you can't. Um, that happened to me. So that is <laughs> a perfect example of something not to do. I didn't test it ahead of time. I just assumed I could click this button that should share screen and I would be able to share it. Um, also make sure you understand the various technologies that you're in and understand how they work and what buttons to click and what buttons not to click. Um, luckily, I have not had the experience of having my camera left on when I thought it had been turned off or having a microphone on when I thought that I had muted it. Um, but I have had friends who have had that. I have had um, organizations where I've been on a call and someone thought that they were muted and they weren't and they were yelling at their kids. So make sure you understand the technology before before you, you jump on. Um, do a test with a friend. That's totally fine. See if there's someone out there who can help you and, and guide you if you've never been on the technology before. Um, I don't play a lot with the screen backgrounds. I think they're distracting, but people love them. So um, that's, that's more of a personal choice if you want to do that or not. Um, there was another one, but I just lost it from a personal experience. Oh, well, if it comes back, I will, I will bring it back up. But oh, what, um, what there about is. food? Yeah, that's where I was going to say, um, try to get rid of distractions when you're on these calls. It's super easy to have your email up and it's super easy to have food and, and other things going on. Uh, unless you know that this is like a coffee meeting and it's totally appropriate to be eating breakfast or uh, that someone um, is is expecting you to, to have food there, a happy hour or something like that, I would keep food out of it just because it, it could be kind of awkward. But also make sure you're paying attention. Um, don't get distracted by those other things, by emails, by um, phone calls, those types of things. I have everything on my computer turned off now except this presentation so that I can't be sidelined by anything. To kind of piggyback off of that, um, I've got a question asking if you have any tips to make um, virtual networking feel more relaxed. Because sometimes it can be kind of stilted to be chatting with somebody virtually. Do you have any tips to ease that? I think that the biggest one that I have seen time and time and that I've used is it goes back to asking better questions. Um, you can make virtual networking as stiff as you want if you make it stiff with the questions you're asking with the interaction that you're having with, with the person on the other end. Um, I try to still incorporate some sort um, of personal get to know you time um, before anything that I do just because I, I need to know these individuals. I need to know the people I'm talking to. I want to have better questions, better conversations. Um, I would encourage you to have better questions in the back of your mind. And if you ask the questions like, what's your story or what do you do for fun? Um, or tell me how you're handling this right now, or tell me what you're learning through COVID. What, what, have, what has been your favorite moment? What, uh, what have you taken the time to do? Um, how have you connected with people? Uh, I had a virtual picnic with a friend a couple weeks ago where we both said, let's grab our computers and go outside. We're tired of being stuck in the house. Um, I wanna see you, but I don't wanna see you in your normal office setting. Um, we each grabbed a bottle of wine, we had some food, and we just had a fun conversation, not stagnant by our surroundings. So um, if you've got that opportunity, I'd encourage you to get out of the house. If you're not comfortable meeting people, go to your yard, go to your patio, um, have a cocktail with someone versus just having the business conversations. I think that's where we get stuck with the stale, with the stiff portion of it. Um, because so many of us now are on Zoom for so many hours a day. Um, it could just be one of those things where we don't want to be on it at night, but you can make it more fun uh, if you choose to by the settings, by the questions, and by what you're doing. A virtual picnic idea sounds great. So I love that. Thanks for sharing that one. Um, it was awesome. I highly I bet it was. Yeah, it's nice to be outside. <laughs> We've got a question here in the chat asking if you could discuss backlighting so people can see you better on Zoom calls. Yeah, I think I read somewhere and I've incorporated it that overhead lighting is the best 
um, because it allow it gets rid of most of the shadows plus it allows you to be seen well on the screen um, and so I again back to testing stuff making sure you understand how things are working before you jump on the call um, get on a zoom if you if you have the time ahead of time um, get on just with your own personal account if you haven't done that yet you can set up a free account all you need is an email address and you can dummy host a zoom meeting where you can see your screen you can see your camera ahead of time and you can see what your lighting looks like play with it there before you get on the call um, again I, I really think it's that that overhead lighting is the best for most situations um, outdoor lighting's typically always great back to that outdoor picnic um, but really just make sure that you feel like you look good in the space that you're in and the easiest way to do that is just to test it ahead of time and would you recommend the same for microphones Yes, definitely. And make sure your AirPods are fully charged before you start the call or they die with about 15 minutes left. And then you have to panic and get your uh, microphone reconnected without the AirPods in. Fair enough, that's great advice. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking from about 30 seconds ago of experience. Fair enough. Um, do you have any recommendations after you've had a networking experience, whether it's a Zoom or a phone call, about how to stay connected with those individuals? Is there a best platform or a follow-up that you default to? Anything like that? Um, I would say, depending on the relationship and how the connection went, um, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn, always have been, and I think unless something really crazy that comes along is way better, I always will be a big fan of LinkedIn and connecting with people there. Um, I think that's probably the most appropriate for a first time meeting someone that you don't know that you, you happen to meet and, and have done a zoom call with. Um, but after that, if, if it was a really great conversation, if you had a genuine connection, if you feel that next steps are appropriate, um, I would encourage other social media platforms as well outside of LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, depending on the level of, of friendship or what the acquaintanceship looks like, you know, Instagram, Snapchat. Um, they're all great tools that, that you can use to get to know someone, but also learn more about people, see where they are in life, see what they're doing in their free time. Um, I, I would definitely encourage those types of connections. Most of the time, if you've had the opportunity to do a Zoom meeting, you've got someone's email address then. So um, there's a lot of people that I got connected with over the last three months that I did Zooms that I'm now reaching back out to and saying, hey, if you're comfortable, would you like to grab a cup of coffee? Do you want to go have a socially distanced uh, conversation um, on a patio somewhere just to get to, to see them in person and get to know them a little bit better? Um, this is probably one of my weakest areas. I don't do a lot with the CRM. I don't do a lot of tracking. Most of my follow-up and most of what I do is either guided by Google Calendar um, or just by my own memory, which is probably, again, not the, the best thing to do, but um, I'll see something that will remind me of someone and I'll message them and say, hey, it's been a while, let's grab coffee or let's get together and do a Zoom call. And that's how a lot of my follow-ups are done and a lot of my follow-ups are guided. All right, I think that LinkedIn probably is everyone's default platform right now, so that's great to hear. Um, you've mentioned a couple times asking better questions. And so I've got a question here asking what the most interesting question you have asked or been asked is. One of my favorite that I have ever been asked, um, actually it, it happened just last week with a friend through, through this whole COVID thing. Um, and it was, what is the biggest joy you've had during the last three months or whatever the, the time frame was? And I know it was related because of the, the isolation, because of the shutdowns. I know it was because of COVID, but I think I'm going to just steal that moving forward um, because we don't have to be stuck in a pandemic to have really great, joyful things happen. Um, and it totally shifted my perspective in that moment. Like, my brain went from doom and gloom, cases rising, yada, 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 to what has been joyful in my life. And oh my gosh, I've had so many great blessings. I've had so many opportunities. I've been able to, to connect with my kids and my wife on a level that I haven't been able to connect with them at on a long time. Um, you know, we, we've built new relationships with old friends <laughs> um, throughout all of this. Um, and there's just been a lot of really great quality time with the people that I care the most about because of everything that's going on. 
Um, so again, it just totally shifted my perspective in that moment. And uh, I hope that I don't forget that and I can continue to use that question into the future. That's a great question. And what a great thing for us to talk about rather than how is social distancing going? So that's, right. that's excellent. Yeah. Yep. All right, the um, next question for you is what one or two things do you wish you had known as an intern or early on in your career? Oh, that one's good. Um, the one we've already kind of touched on, and that's the, the tell people what you want. I feel like a lot of times, specifically early on in our careers, we feel like we don't provide a lot of value and we don't have a lot to offer people. And so it, it kind of inhibits us from getting out there and explaining what we're doing and why we're doing it and how people can help us. Um, and so I wish someone would have kicked me early on in my career and said, hey, the only way for people to know how they can help you is for you to tell them. Because if I would have taken that advice, I probably would have made some changes, not saying I have any regrets, but it, it would have jump-started a lot of things that it took me until I was almost 30 to learn. Um, the other thing that I would continue to dis just can stress um, for people on this call, for people early on in their careers, and honestly, for the seasoned veterans, I still need to be reminded of this um, time and time again, um, is to give yourself credit. Um, you know things, you can do things that other people can't and other people envy you for. Um, so it kind of goes along with that first one, but uh, don't sell yourself short. There's going to be opportunities. There's going to be things that you can do that other people can't. Um, they just come natural, come easy, uh, that, that you're able to do that other people simply cannot do. So don't put off having that coffee. Don't put off connecting with people because you don't think that you can provide something of value or you don't think that there's a, a reason for you to connect. I'm a big fan. Uh, I had coffee uh, with Suku Radia. I don't know, it's probably been eight, nine years ago now. Um, you know, past CEO of Bankers Trust, he was voted the most influential person in Des Moines, like 27 years running. I know I'm exaggerating, but I'm not exaggerating by much. Um, and we had a great conversation. I just wanted to get to know him and hear his story. And at the end of the coffee, I asked him why he was willing to take the meeting with me. Um, he looked me in the eyes and said, Danny, the first meeting is free. You have to earn the second. Um, and I've, I've taken that to heart. I'll meet with anybody once if they ask me for a meeting. Uh, I, I'm not so high in my time and my time isn't so valuable that I can't have a conversation with someone. Uh, and that has opened so many awesome doors and opportunities for me because I've just made myself available. So um, I would encourage everybody, I know it's a Jay Byers saying, but would you rather be in Des Moines and be a contributor, be, be an individual, be a voice, or would you rather go to Chicago or some other large metropolitan area and be a number? It's a true saying, you can make a difference, you can have an impact in a very short amount of time in this community if you want to put forth the effort and you want to connect with people. I think that's a great way to wrap this up unless anybody has any other questions. Um, I can second what Danny just said about connecting and um, really putting in that time here in Des Moines, you've got a lot of great leaders that are willing to have those meetings. So thanks for mentioning that, Danny. Um, if we don't have any more questions, and it looks like we don't in the chat. Um, Danny, thank you so much for spending your time with us this afternoon, for sharing some knowledge and being willing to chat through some tips or tricks that you've developed both pre-COVID and post or during COVID in this virtual networking environment. So we really appreciate that. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Sydney, Mike, and uh, you guys should all definitely check out Ryan's thing on July 1st. I know Ryan and he's, uh, he's really great at this stuff. So yeah, up. I think he's going to build a lot on what we learned today and talking about the LinkedIn accounts. Um, so registration link will come. If you aren't a member of the LinkedIn group, I encourage you to send me an email or look us up on the Greater Des Moines Partnership website. And there's a link straight there and all of those registration details will be posted there. So Thanks again, Danny. Um, we really appreciate your time. And thanks everyone who joined us. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of the week and really enjoy some of the sunshine we've got. Thanks everybody.